Welcome to Thinking West. I'm Christian Poole. Today we're talking about the practical benefits of reading the great books from an educational standpoint. So here we're really asking the question, why read the great books um, in, terms of, um, in terms of its learning qualities? There are many other books out there much easier to read than these, so why choose these for an education? And I think that we can break down the answers into three categories, at least in my estimation, into what I describe as factual, mechanical, and philosophical. No matter what book we read, we're gathering information. Whether it's true or not is another question. Even reading fiction gives us information about, well, at least what an author wrote about. No doubt there is information contained in fictional worlds, though none of them are true. But what kind of information does reading the great books give us? Well, on first thought, we might say it educates us in the areas of uh, grammar and literature. And that's certainly true. We have Homer, Cervantes, Swift, and Tolstoy to learn from in those categories, and those are some of the best. Uh, but we also get quite a bit more than that, so we know that great books spans more than just um, fictional works of literature, right? We also get some of the best poetry by people like Chaucer, Wordsworth, and Longfellow. And we can keep going with this concept, as you see where this is probably going already. Uh, we also get more than just uh, fiction and poetry. We get plays. We get uh, the Greek playwrights like Aeschylus, and we get Shakespeare and others. And among these, uh, this literature, poetry, and, and plays, we're not only getting some of the best work out there, but we're getting the breadth over all these areas um, in, in a compa fairly compact set that we like to think of as the great books. And while this is not, not limited to any one particular set like the Harvard Classics or the great books of the Western world sets, we mean the great books um, at large. At this point, I think, is where many people might stop and say, this is where the great books leaves us. We get grammar, literature, we uh, study poetry, we study uh, plays. But it really goes much further than this, as the great book spans a much wider swath of, of fields and areas of study than um, might be initially thought. If you've looked through any of the lists of the great books that we have at thinkingwest.com, you'll immediately get a sense of how broad... Um, an education based on reading the great books, like any classical education would be. And we'll get into th some of those topics, but I also want to note that in reading any of these topics, not only are we getting such a broad um, span of, of all these different fields, from um, things like science and history and philosophy, as I'll get into a little more detail, we also get the best of each of those. And by the best, I mean at least those that have been passed on and that are timeless um, and that their authors and their writings never died off. They weren't lost to history for us. They have continued on and continued educating generation after generation uh, until this very day. There's something innately useful and important about that very fact. And one of the ways that this plays into um, an education is that in reading any old book, we're not only reading about the contents of that book, but we're also learning something about the time in which that book was written uh, and read. And so, in any reading, we learn history. Not only from the greats like Plutarch, Herodotus, and Gibbon, but also from the e even fictional works, um, like those of Tolstoy. Um, we can learn something about their time and, and the people during those times by learning about what they were interested in reading. Now, particularly, we get this historical context behind um, many of the great books that even aren't explicitly historical in their contents by reading through works uh, chronologically. And so many of the great books programs out there suggest starting from the, say, um, pre-Socratic Greeks and continuing all the way until the 20th century. Some might take you toward the 21st century now, but the point is that we read chronologically so we can see the development of ideas, and that is a history lesson in itself, to know where ideas have come from and how they've developed over time. Now, Susan Wise Bauer, author of The Well-Educated Mind, put this concept very succinctly uh, this way. She said, quote, When you read chronologically, you reunite two fields that should never have been separated in the first place, history and literature. To study literature is to study what people thought, did, believed, suffered, and argued about in the past. This is history. 
History can't be detached from the study of the written record, nor should literature be removed from its historical context. End quote. Moving on, we also get some of the best of philosophy in reading the great books. We obviously have Plato, Aristotle, Bacon, and the rest. I don't think I need to say much here that philosophy is a huge part of reading the great books, and one of my favorite aspects. And piggybacking off that, we also have religion and theology, given by some of the great uh, saints, uh, like St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, we have Pascal as well, Calvin, Nietzsche. All these serve as important figures in the development of religions around the world. We can also then dive into other fields, and smaller fields, albeit, but also important things to have some understanding of. One would be psychology, where we get um, probably the most well-known uh, psychologist, Sigmund Freud. The great books also cover uh, political science and government uh, quite extensively through figures like Machiavelli, the U.S. Constitution, Locke, and many others, especially toward toward the uh, more recent times. While not probably as explicit as some of these other uh, fields that the great books uh, span, uh, there is also lash logic and rational argumentation. So I'd argue that in many of the works, um, say on uh, philosophy and religion, but also once we get into some of the mathematical works, we get a good education, at least a good starting point in understanding the basics of logic and, uh, and some rational argumentation. How to argue effectively and how to connect our points into one cohesive argument. That's a very important thing for today and I think something that has certainly been left out of our um, normal public or private education. Now the great books also cover things on economics. We have most famously Adam Smith and Karl Marx. Um, I think there is you know, somewhat of a gap in, in what are considered many of the great books less than that. They don't include some of the uh, Austrian schools of thought. But uh, regardless, that's, that's a debate for another time. Now finally we get to the last category of, edu uh, of factual education that I would say the great books in parts, at least in, in some respects. And here I like to think of these more as introductions to the philosophy and the methods of science and mathematics. Reading the great books is not going to make you a great mathematician or scientist in the un of themselves. Um, as someone whose day job is doing mostly math and science, reading the great books is not going to give you the practical skills you need to excel um, alone. But they will give you introductions into how math and philosophy are done and how they have been done in times past. So here we have figures like Euclid, Galileo, William Harvey, Newton, Faraday, and a few others that are spread out through many of the um, quote-unquote great books. Here I'm thinking of things like those included in the great books of the Western world explicitly, but of course we're not limiting our discussion to simply one uh, version of the great books. Now the weakness here is that to, to really understand math and science and to become proficient at it, you really need to practice it. So it's, it's a practical um, field and others might argue that some of the others are and you know I won't I won't entirely disagree since I, I can't say for sure. Mastery will not come to anyone in, in these fields without hands-on experience. That's just the nature of of those fields. But nonetheless, uh, reading mathematical texts has been said to train one's brain for rigor. Um, Abraham Lincoln, when returning to his law practice after some of his first forays into politics, um, recognized the cloudiness of his mind and turned to some mathematical texts, specifically Euclid's works, which are, you know, in many of the great books uh, out there, um, to sharpen his mind. And, and so it did, and his law practice was very successful. So I must think, conclude that it worked. Now, I will note also that one of the areas, the, the fields I say would, would definitely be missing in an education based solely on the great books would be that of music. So, obviously, music also requires a very practical element. Um, simply reading about music or even just looking at notes on a page is not um, really a, an education in music. One needs to play or at least to listen uh, to great music to understand it. And just remember that in reading any of these, we aren't covering uh, one subject singularly, but always in pairs. There's always history and literature uh, that are merged into one experience. And the same with the works on, on the philosophy, religion, and all other fields already mentioned. There's always a historical element and a literature element combined into the reading of philosophy, into religion, and all other things that we've mentioned here. So, that was a uh, quite long-winded way to say that, yeah, re reading the great books gives you facts on various different fields, but it gives you some of the best facts 
um, from the best people. Now point two is that in reading the great books we have a mechanical education in reading. What I mean by that is that, well, it's quite simply reading these books improves our reading skills and our minds. So reading the great books, in other words, uh, as others have said, stretches the mind. So simultaneously, while learning the factual information that we gain from the great books, we're also training our brains and sharpening our minds from the pens of the uh, world's greatest contributors. And some of the quickly, some of the areas that uh, reading will, you know, the great books will improve uh, are in the areas of vocabulary. We often come by some of the more difficult language than before and some of the older terminologies, depending on when the work that we're reading was translated. Uh, we can also improve our reading comprehension speed, ability to follow complex thoughts. This exercises our ability to think, especially in reading some of the works that have a more logical uh, bent to them. Now, Mortimer Adler and Charles Van Doren in How to Read a Book wrote this, quote, If you are reading in order to become a better reader, you cannot read just any book or article. You must tackle books that are beyond you or, as we have said, books that are over your head. Only books of that sort will make you stretch your mind. And unless you stretch, you will not learn. End quote. And so, I couldn't say any better myself. Reading stretches our mind and improves our mechanical reading abilities. And remember that all this mechanical benefit to reading the great books is also accompanied by what we talked about on point one, that uh, we are simultaneously learning all these new fields, um, be it history, theology, economics, etc. And lastly, point number three, and perhaps the most important of all, is the philosophical education that we get. Lastly, we read these great books not merely to know facts about various fields, but to understand the meaning of them and how they relate to one another and how ultimately we may live better by knowing. Ultimately, the summation of why I read the great books is the pursuit of wisdom. If I were to give one answer, it would be in the pursuit of wisdom. These great books are really, the I think of them as the diary of our civilization and telling us about the waxing and waning of ideas through time. Now, what I think is a mistake is the assumption that the later works in the great books are the, the better works, the ones that have the the more correct ideas. So viewing the great books as an evolutionary process I think is a mistake. Instead we can see them more as a history of the development of ideas, um, some of which are right, some of which are wrong, and some which maybe we don't know and we're still trying to work out. Robert Hutchins in his The Great Conversation work, which is the intro to the uh, great books of the Western World set, wrote this, quote, the aim of education is wisdom and each must have the chance to become as wise as he can." End quote. Now while I do think the great books does help us to become more wise, I will caveat that I don't think it's the only thing that will help us ultimately become wise. I think experience plays a big part in that. Um, of course, living real life outside of a book is ultimately the most important thing. Um, but I do think that reading the great books will jumpstart us on the path to um, becoming more wise by picking back off of the giants that have come before us. So I love this next quote by Harold Bloom in How to Read and Why, because I think it captures our, our 21st century uh, so very well. He writes, quote, Information is endlessly available to us. Where shall wisdom be found? End quote. So like the internet, we have information constantly at our fingertips, and now even in our pockets, and maybe someday in the near future in our, in our very minds. But few places will we find wisdom in how better to live our lives. And I think the great books are one lasting example uh, of a place to turn to for, for greater wisdom for not only at an individual level, but also as a greater society. So there are the three main benefits to reading the great books. From an educational standpoint, we have them again. One, in learning diverse fields from the masters of those fields. That's the factual. Two, we have the mechanical sharpening of our minds our reading skills, and thirdly, we have the understanding and wisdom aspects. So thanks again for tuning in to Thinking West, Great Books Explored. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to continue the great conversation next time. Also, be sure to check out our website where we have dozens of original articles on all sorts of topics related to the great books and history and education, all sorts of things of that matter, and also to learn more about some of the popular great book sets that are out there. And as always, most importantly, read on.